Long before the Pythagoreans uh, proved the Pythagorean theorem in general, there were special cases of it that were known, in particular this one triangle uh, whose sides are linked 3, 4, and 5. This was known in Egypt, and it was used as a surveying um, aid. So if you took a rope that was 12 units long, and you divided it up and tied knots every, uh, every certain distance, like after, every, after four units, then after three more, then after five more, and you put it together like this and stretched it out, you'd be guaranteed that you'd have a right angle here in the corner. So uh, this was um, a known fact, but it's not clear that they really had a proof of this. It was just that um, it, was, it was a good way to get a right angle. Um, and so this actually is historically sort of the beginning of the Pythagorean theorem, because if you notice that if you square the sides here, take 3 squared plus 4 squared, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, and uh, add them up and you get 25, which is 5 squared. All right. So this is a pattern that appears to be um, sort of intriguing. And so the question is, is it always true? And it turns out, Yes, it is. That's the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, the other question arises is, how do you find the third side if you know two sides? Well, the simple answer today is you square this and you square this and add them together like this. And then you take the square root to get the other side. But finding square roots of numbers in general is a little tricky. We're going to go over that on a separate video. But... Uh, in the ancient world, that was a very difficult process. However, in certain special cases, it came out even. So, for instance, 25. Well, there's a whole number, 5, whose square is 25. So 5 is the square root of 25. So, in the cases like this, it was easy. So the question arises, are there other triangles like this? Is this a rare occurrence, or are there a lot of them? It turns out there are an infinite number of varieties of triangles that have um, this property that you can have the Pythagorean relationship that one number squared plus another number squared adds up to a perfect square uh, for the third number. And, um, and so the question is, how do we find those? Well, we're going to do this a couple of different ways. And the first way, it should be accessible to pretty much everybody. Uh, we're going to use a spreadsheet and just hunt for them. And we're going to use the power of a computer to do repetitious things uh, quickly and easily. And use that to uh, hunt down Pythagorean triples, as they're called. Three numbers that have this property. that their squares add up. Um, after that, we're going to do another video that uh, requires some more algebra background. If you've had Algebra 1, and in particular if you've uh, had the factoring pattern for the difference of two squares, you might want to review that if you've been through it and have forgotten about it. But uh, we're going to use that as the basis for actually trying to um, find a pattern that can generate these triples uh, more easily. So in this video, we're going to just uh, start with a spreadsheet uh, program that's going to hunt for Pythagorean triples. Okay, here we have a spreadsheet, and I'm going to do a program that's going to take uh, two legs of a right triangle and calculate the hypotenuse, and we can check to see if it's a whole number. So what I'm going to do is on the far left column, I'll put a sequence of numbers starting with 1, and then in the next one, I'll say equals the previous value plus 1. We do it like that. And then I can take that formula and drag it down. Okay. And so these, this gives us a sequence of lengths of one of the legs. Let's do the same thing across this top row for the second leg. So if I start with a 1 here, to, for the formula, we start with an equals. And I'm going to say I want to take this one plus 1. Okay, and now I can copy this one across. By the way, when I copy a formula, uh, it, it makes all the references what they call relative references. Like, for instance, 
this one here, it says A2 plus 1. This cell is A3. Cell A2 is the one right above it. And so I'm going to take the cell right above it plus 1. If I chose this cell, this is cell A9, it's going to take cell A8 plus 1. Again, the one right above it. So it's not always going to come back to the same original cell and add 1. It's going to take whichever one was immediately above it and add 1. Same thing over here. So here I'm looking to the left, and so this is going to take B1 and add 1. Well, B1 is right here. This one is going to take F1 and add 1. Well, here's F1, the one immediately to the left, and it's going to increment it, or in other words, add 1 to it. Okay? Now, for a given leg, like say the 4 here and the 3 here, we want to put in this cell, we're going to put the hypotenuse. And that's the same for all of these. So let's start in the corner here, and I want to say, if uh, the legs of this triangle are 1 and 1, what's the hypotenuse? Okay, well, we can use the Pythagorean theorem for that. So I'll say equals. We're going to do a formula. I want to take the square root of the sum of the squares. So I type SQRT, and that's the way you indicate a square root in most programming languages. And then I'm going to take this number squared, and so I use the little caret symbol, which is right above the 6 on your keyboard, uh, and then put a 2. So that's like an exponent. So b1 raised to the second power or squared. Then I go plus, then I'm going to take this number squared and close the parentheses. So it's going to be b1 squared plus a2 squared. Enter. And there we go. And so notice it did not come out a whole number. All right. Now, this formula we want to put everywhere, but there's a little problem we have to fix first. Let's see what the problem is. And if I spread it out, let's see if these are giving us the numbers we expect. Well, one that we know is if I took a 3 here and a 4 here, so go to this column here, we would expect to get a 5. But we don't have a 5. Let's see why not. Look at the formula that we have in this cell. This says the square root of e3 squared plus d4 squared. Well, e3 is right here, directly above, and d4 is this one right here, directly to the left. That's what happened when we were in the first cell. We took the cell directly above and directly to the left. Remember we talked about relative referencing of the cells? In this case, we don't want a relative reference. We want an absolute reference. We want to say, I want to go all the way to that top row to get that number to square. And I want to go all the way over to the left column and use that number to square. Okay? So you can make these references absolute instead of relative if we pin down the row number here and we pin down the column uh, here with a little dollar sign in the formula. Let's see how that works. So come back to here. And for this number, which is B1, look for the B1 up here, we want to pin down the row. We want to make sure it's, we're picking this out of the first row. So I put my cursor there and put a dollar sign in front of the 1. So it's going to be in column B. Uh, the B part is relative still. I didn't pin that down. But I have uh, the row is absolute. I'm going to go all the way to that row. It's always going to be B1. Okay. And then over here, I want the column to be an absolute reference, and that's going to be A2. Well, look at A2. I want to make sure it's A2. I always want it to be A whatever. So I put a dollar sign in front of A. So notice this pins down row 1 in this case, and it pins down uh, column A in this case. Let's see what we have. Okay. Now this one comes out the same as before, but let's see what happens when we copy it across. There. Now we're seeing things we recognize. Notice if I have a 4 here and a 3 here, it comes out 5, or if I have a 3 here and a 4 here, it comes out 5. Those are being calculated correctly. Let's check it. This says D1, so it goes all the way to the top row. This says A5, so it goes all the way to the left column. There we go.
Okay, so now that we have a formula that works, let's copy the formulas that we put here, and let's copy them all the way across, and copy them all the way down to here, and there we have it. Notice that several of these turn out to be whole numbers. But let's clean it up. This is a bit cluttered. Okay, uh, it's, you, have, you can pick them out because of all the blank space, and you could just leave it like this if you wanted to, and you could find whole number solutions. But let's make it so that all these uh, non-whole number solutions disappear, and let's see how to do that. Okay, what I want to do is to make it so that if it's a whole number, it'll print, and if it's not a whole number, I'm going to print a blank instead. So the way we do that, let's go up to the top cell and uh, tinker with this formula a bit. I'm going to copy this square root of B, B1 squared plus A1, A2 squared and go control C. That's a copy. What I want is so that uh, this is going to be the formula for the hypotenuse. And I'm going to start with an if statement. So I say if in opening parentheses. Now look at the little hint that it came up with here. It says if, and it says test, and then comma, then value, comma, otherwise value, in parenthesis. Okay? So our test is going to be, is this square root a whole number? The way we can see if it's a whole number is to see, is this square root equal to the integer value of the square root, the chopped off value of the square root? There's an int function in most programming languages, including um, the spreadsheet language here. And the integer value of a number, it simply throws away the decimal part and leaves the whole number part of it. All right. So if I say, is this square root equal to the integer value of the same square root? I just type control V, which is paste. I just drop that same formula back in. It's looking clumsy, but it's uh, but we're simply just dropping this formula in whenever we need to get the, the hypotenuse. Okay, so is the square root of the sum of the squares equal to the integer value of that same expression? That's our test. Now, what if it is? If it is, I want to print, like say the five here. I want to print the square root of the sum of the squares, which will give us that number. So I'll just go control V. Oh, that's what I'll print, comma. So that's the then value. So if this is a true statement, it'll print the number. What if it's not a whole number? So it, this test failed, it comes, it comes out false. What I want to print is a blank um, character in there. And the way you can do a blank character is to produce an, an empty string if I wanted to type a bunch of words or something, I could start with a quote and then type my letters and then a, a finishing quote, and it would just copy those characters as they stood. But in this case, I just want blank, and so I put quote, quote, so it's an empty string. And so that's what I'm going to print in the case that it does not work out to be a whole number. There you go. Notice we got a blank here because this did not work out to be a whole number. Well, let's see what happens when I propagate this across. Well, that first entire row was blank. I come down. There we go. I have blanks everywhere except where I have whole numbers. So that's sort of a cleaned up version of this program. You can use the program in the simpler form if this is a little bit too much for you. Um, or you can uh, do the program with this nice cleaned up version like this. Um, the, one of the project problems is going to be to take this same kind of a process and you write the program and say calculate all the Pythagorean triples where the legs are less than 100. So you can go out to 100 in each of these directions and see what you get. All right. Um, I'm going to show you one little thing though. Is if I wanted to go out further, I'm not going to have very much space horizontally because these are big, huge cells and the numbers aren't that big. So the way that you can uh, shrink down the size of these all at once is choose this top left cell here. Actually, not a cell, this little marker in the corner here. That selects everything. And then if I change the width of a column on one of them, 
it'll make that the width of the column on all of them. Okay, so then for instance, I could I could propagate this formula all the way over to here, and then take these that I've computed like this, and copy them over to here, and copy them down to here, and there you go. I've gone larger. And if you go even further, you can go off the screen and go all the way out to 100 by 100 and get your values that way. So these are Pythagorean triples. This is called a brute force technique. We're simply using the power of the computer to com perform tedious computations over and over again. Um, in a later program, we're going to do this where we can uh, come up with a formula to generate Pythagorean triples. But now that we have this, look at some patterns we have. For instance, look at this 5 and 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. And it looks like they're all in a straight row, on a straight line here. Okay. Um, this was our uh, famous 3, 4, 5 triangle. This one is 6, 8, 10, which is that's those same numbers doubled. Here is 9, 12, 15, which is that same original one tripled. And this one's times 4, times 5, and so forth. So all of these are actually a family of triples that are based on this one, which is called a primitive uh, Pythagorean triple. So I'm going to just color code the primitive one. Let's put it yellow there in the background. Okay. And so this whole family, you can say, yeah, 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 these are all the same thing. It's just that they're multiples of this original. And then you take a different one, like this one, it says 13. Okay. So 5, 12, 13. Well, here's one that says 26, which is 10, 24, 26. So this is twice as big as 5, twice as big as 12, and twice as big as 13. So here's another one. This is a primitive one. And so if I make that one yellow, and then the 26 is a part of a line that will appear if you go farther, okay, and so forth. So you could basically uh, pick out um, the primitive ones out of this, and then the ones that are simply multiples, uh, you could filter those out somehow. Okay. Also notice that all of these appear twice. Like here's a 5, and here's a 5. Here's a 13, and here's a 13. And that's because if this, is, if this one is 12, and this one is 5, I get 13. But if this one up here is 12, and this one is a 5, I get 13. So, uh, each one is going to be generated twice. You could do some fancy programming that would eliminate the duplicates, but uh, for now we'll just leave those and just be aware that the top half of the chart is going to give you one set, and the bottom half is just like a mirror image of those. Here's a 20, there's a 20, 25, 25, and so forth. The reason these don't look like a 45 degree angle is that the cells are not perfect squares, they're little rectangles there. Okay, uh, so much for this. This one is a brute force technique. You can generate a lot of triples and look at the patterns and so forth. Uh, but in the next video, we're going to actually come up with a formula to generate these numbers directly. That one takes more algebra, so you might or might not be prepared for that. And if you're not up to that, uh, just skip over it. Okay.